Hey friends, have you been blessed or encouraged or challenged by Theology in the Raw? If so, would you consider joining Theology in the Raw's Patreon community? For as little as five bucks a month, you can gain access to a diverse group of Jesus followers who are committed to thinking deeply, loving widely, and having curious conversations with thoughtful people. We have several membership tiers where we where you can receive premium content. For instance, silver level supporters get to ask and vote on the questions for our monthly Patreon only podcast. They also get to see like written drafts of various projects and books I'm working on. And there's other perks for that tier. Gold level supporters get all of this and access to monthly Zoom chats where we basically blow the doors open on any topic they want to discuss. All of my, of my patrons play a vital role in nurturing the mission of Theology and Raw. And for me, just personally, interacting with my Patreon supporters has become one of the hidden blessings in this podcast ministry. So you can check out all of the info at patreon.com forward slash Theology and Raw. That's patreon.com forward slash Theology and Raw. Hello, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Theology in the Raw. My guest today is Dr. Sandra Glan, who has a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary and a PhD from University of Texas at Dallas and is a professor of media arts and worship at uh, the one and only Dallas Theological Seminary. And Sandra is the author of a forthcoming book called Nobody's Mother, Artemis of the Ephesians in Antiquity and the New Testament, which is the subject of our conversation. Sandra has done just a ton of work on the background of the letters to um, the two letters to Timothy, in particular, as it relates to the Artemis cult and how that interacts with Paul's um, Paul's uh, two letters to Timothy. So please welcome to the show for the first time, the one and only Dr. Sandra Glenn. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. I, I've been wanting to have you on for months. Uh, we have, a, a, I feel like I have a growing number of mutual friends. Every time I talk to somebody, they're like, oh, you got to have Sandra on your podcast. I'm like, I'm trying. So um, here well, we I are. I love the Thanks work you're doing. So it's mutual admiration society here. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. But the main reason why I wanted to have you on, this might spawn various rabbit trails. I don't know, but you're, you've been doing a lot of work on the background of um, Ephesus in particular, how it applies to, you know, the, I guess the pastoral, well, First and second Timothy, with the question of women and in, in the church leadership there. Um, can you give, give us, yeah, just give us a, a brief overview of your work? And I'm sure I'll have tons of questions. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Brief, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, it comes out of my story because my husband and I had 10 years of infertility and pregnancy loss and failed adoptions. I lost seven early pregnancies, three failed adoptions, and a topic. And I'm looking at that little line, a woman will be saved through childbearing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it raises some questions. And the answers that are given uh, in pretty conservative spaces are, well, her it, it means she's supposed to be domestic with her children, mm -hmm. but that is her outlet for teaching. I'm like, and where does that leave me? <laughs> and not just that. I mean, that that began the question. And not just that. How does that square with Paul telling people to think about staying single? Right. Um, I mean, it it raised more questions for me than it answered. And so that's what started. And I remember asking my ob Jin, who was a DTS, a Dallas Seminary grad, uh, you know, what does that mean? And I don't even remember his answer. He's a great scholar, but I just remember going, yeah, no, that's not working. That's, uh, I, I need to explore this for myself. And that's part of why I got a, a THM. Like oh. I had to be able to translate for myself because everything was being mitigated but through through the eyes of people who cared, but were not asking the same questions I was asking. And they weren't questions that had 100% to do with the ramifications for their life like it did right. for me, particularly because I, I was being affirmed in gifts of teaching. And that was the very gift that people are saying, you know, that's supposed to be channeled domestically. Hmm. What am I supposed to do? My view of spiritual gifts doesn't fit with the nuclear family that you're describing. Wow. Wow. So, so we're talking about first Timothy two 15. Um, we are at the end of that complicated, well, <laughs> debated, <laughs> debated passage. Some people say it's straightforward. Um, you know, women shall be saved, but women will be saved through childbearing. If they persevere in. Yeah. I don't yeah. have it off my head, but yeah. Um, yeah. Can you. Listen character qualities. Yeah. So that's where your research, that's kind of initiated your research into this topic. Um, what yeah. what are some of the just as let's just start with that verse. What are some of the main interpretations of that passage? Maybe if you can 
think about them. Um, and then um, why weren't you satisfied with that? And I would love to hear your take on it because I've, I've been wrestling with that passage for a while now too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, good for you and good for you for doing the hard work. So I was sitting in, um, I think it was an ecclesiology course and and it was mentioned that one of the theories uh, of the backdrop for this verse that is is part of a letter from Paul to his protege Timothy, whom he's left in Ephesus, you know, to teach people not, certain people not to teach false doctrine. Um, that that somebody had explored maybe it had to do with Artemis being a fertility goddess and a mother goddess, uh-huh. but uh, it was in the early '90s, and that theory was blown apart, and rightfully so. Because as it was put forward, number one, it was really looking at fourth century sources. Okay. And all we really care about is who was Artemis at the time of Paul. Right. Right? We don't need to know she was in Ephesus in the 10th century BC as a different goddess. And we don't need to know who she was in the 7th century AD. We need to know, yeah, but who would Paul have thought she was? So part of the, the pushback against that idea was that it was the sources were too late. And so I completely wrote it off. Um, so th- anyway, that's one of the big theory. I mean, one is it's straightforward. God made women uh, to be silent in the churches and that men are supposed to be teachers. Or if you want to modify that, women don't teach doctrine or women don't stand in the pulpit. So they can like, you know, something she can lead a small group. Um some go farther in, in application and it's like a man can't learn from a woman, right? right. Yeah. Um, so so there are big questions about the hermeneutics here. Uh, how do we understand what's written and who it was written to? Uh, what, what really shocked me was on my 25th anniversary, my husband took me to Ephesus and I was standing there looking at the story of the city told in stone in an approximately first, second century piece of work. And there are the Amazon women as as part of this city's story. And part of the discounting the Artemis idea was that Amazonians, if they even exist, were completely mythological and had nothing to do with Ephesus. And I'm standing in Ephesus going, okay, <laughs> wait, I just, I just believe what I read. Who was Artemis at the time of Paul? And is it possible that she was on Paul's mind. Okay. Uh, and the and the main reason I wondered that was because of the book of Acts, right? right because right. it it has a very long narrative about Ephesus and it begins with magic happening in Ephesus. And we have the original bonfire of the vanities. Magic is illegal everywhere else in the empire. How was Ephesus getting away with it? Mm-hmm. And right after that magic session, which we often don't connect with Artemis, but we need to, you have this big brouhaha with the basically the souvenir makers who are saying, hey, Paul's cutting into our financial success here because right. he's teaching the gods made with hands aren't real gods. And hello, our goddess is made with hands. And, you know, long story short, Paul was already planning to leave for Macedonia. He'd been in Ephesus for a couple of years and it's time to go. So he's prepping it to leave. But, it, you know, he kind of runs out of town a little faster and this is probably the occasion for saying to Timothy, who Timothy had gone ahead to Macedonia. My guess is, totally guess, that Paul dropped him off in Miletus on his way back. And okay. the reason I left you in Ephesus was to teach certain people not to teach false doctrine. Now, my translation had said to teach certain men. And once I got into Greek, I'm like, that's the word for person. Huh. That, certain people. So that then I reread the letter. Okay, is there evidence that men and women are teaching falsehood in the city? And then I'm looking at verses like, you know, some women are teaching old wives tales. I'm like, well, that sounds like a little bit of a um, stereotype. And sure enough, you did some word study on that and some of the latest research and go, that word may connect to magic. And oh, wow. Wait, what, what passage is that? That's... Uh, it's in the it's in one of the Timothys. Sorry, I don't have it in front of me, but no, they're going yeah. house to house teaching nonsense where, you know, old wives tales is. Yeah. Is one of them. Um, and going house to house is the same language that Luke is using to describe the church. 
meeting house to have. Oh, oh, so not just going into individual nuclear homes, but going into. So I pictured girlfriends going back door to back door gossiping. Gossip is also another translation in there. And it's like, oh, maybe this is women going from house church to house church, teaching magic-y sorts of nonsense. So, I mean, there are other hints that that men also are leading women astray here. Um, So first question I'm asking right out of the shoot is, is it possible that women are teaching in Ephesus, uh, not just men, and that Paul is saying certain people need to not teach false doctrine? And Timothy, it's part of your job to set that straight. And the rest of the book is we're going to organize. We're going to have deacons and elders, widows, in my in my view, um, deaconesses, female deacons. Um, So we're going to organize the church with mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers. Um, And you know, one of the ways to fight this is going to be let them learn, but yeah, in quietness. So it, it. as I hear, so and it's um first Timothy 5 13 for the for the listeners where the women are going house to house. And in that mm-hmm. I think that passage is often neglected, the whole I mean the really lengthy treatment on, on widows in First Timothy 5. Yes. Sometimes we leave that out of the there's a lot on women in but all the pastorals, really. And if yes. we just read the last part of chapter two in isolation, I think we do don't get the full context. That's that's super helpful. Um house to house, that's funny. I, I as much as I've reoriented my mind when I see house in the New Testament, not to think of a modern day house, I've never thought of that passage in that way. That that's um yeah, I'm gonna so go. Back. I I got us off on a little bit on a bunny trail. Oh, that's great. Who is Artemis <laughs> and why does she matter? Yes. So yes. Well, if, yeah. if Artemis is why Paul gets run out of town, I want to know she obviously has a huge pull on this very important city. I want to know who she is. And I don't just want to know who the synoptic Artemis is from the 7th century BC to the 4th century or whatever AD. I want to know who she is at the time of Paul. You know, a lot of us have been to Ephesus and and you see the library there. Yeah, You got to erase it because the library wasn't there while Paul was there. Like, so as I'm walking through, I'm going, I want to know who was here and what was happening in Paul and Timothy's world. Mm -hmm. And it's a wonderful time to be asking that because we have the internet now and we have access to the inscriptions that have been entered from Artemis, I'm sorry, from Ephesus. And I can do, I could sit in my jammies in my living room and type in Artemis Artemidas, you know, the forms of Artemis and find what is said about her in the inscriptions in Ephesus. First century. And like dated first to the- century. <laughs> yes. So, and in fact, um, you know, the Romans loved inscriptions. Mm-hmm. And it's such a gift to Bible scholars because it's like leaving us with a context lexicon all over the empire for the very languages that we need to be giving, giving a context for scripture. And it's so underutilized. And when you and I pick up a, a Koine Greek lexicon, it isn't including all the inscriptions. So there's all this work, maybe a couple major ones, but not the thousands. You know, uh, one scholar estimates are half a million of them that we haven't drawn on to give us a context for a lot of words. So I wanted to know, what are they saying about Artemis in the first century? But I also had to go back and say, well, who, what's the backstory on her? Um, And so I'm looking at Homer and I'm seeing, okay, she's committed to virginity. That's the number one thing. She is committed to virginity. And are there hints in first Timothy that there are a lot of virgins in Ephesus? (laughs) Um, And then to learn that the word widow doesn't necessarily mean you've ever lost a husband. It's a without a man, woman. So. Oh, it doesn't necessarily. Uh, wait, the, the word yeah. doesn't have to mean. So we fought, we have a reference in one of the church fathers to the, the, the widows who are virgins. You're like, huh? Oh, OK. So in the same way that English doesn't have a word for an older woman who's never been married, we have ugly words. Uh, you know, spinster, yeah. <laughs> gross, yeah. right? Old but we picture. don't really have, we need good vocabulary. And they didn't either. And so it was so rare in first century Ephesus. Uh, I shouldn't say in Ephesus. It was so rare in the, the world that's using Koine Greek for a woman to have never been married and to be older. So we don't have an actual word for that in the same way that we have gune, which can mean wife or woman, because 
once you're past maidenhood, once you start menstruating, you know, you get paired up with somebody and it's just very rare to be a woman who's not married. So you don't need separate words for woman and wife like we do in English. Mm -hmm. So that's part of what we have to consider when we're talking about all the different verses in the New Testament of limiting women. Because in in 1 Timothy 2, the woman in mind is going to be saved through childbearing. Now, is that a woman or is that a wife? The wife. Right? You would assume the, the contextual clue might suggest, well, what if we read this, I'm not allowing a wife to teach or obtain a husband? Is there something going on in the husband-wife dynamic that's awkward in public? It's just a question to add to the discussion. Um, often we assume that he can't be talking about wives because earlier he's talking about women's modesty. But again, that's looking from an American context where there are lots of single women. If you have a 15-year-old, she's going to be paired up with somebody. And mm -hmm. modesty is not really a problem among the 13, 14-year-olds because mom and dad are really dictating mm -hmm. what kind of messaging she is sending. But also there's a huge, huge class element that we tend to tend to, I mean, we use the word modest that way too. He has a modest house, we might say, but yeah. it's not our primary understanding for the word. But right after he wants women to or wives to be modest, he's talking about gold and pearls and yeah. fancy apparel. Right, right. So, am I all over the map enough for you? I, no, I, 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 I want to read your book right now. I want you to email it to me and I want to read it because <laughs> this is so interesting to me. So Three quarters of my book is just asking who is Artemis. Okay. And my goal really is not setting out to solve, quote, solve First Timothy 2. It certainly has ramifications for it. But probably the biggest takeaway is Artemis in Ephesus in the first century has a unique flavor for Artemis in that she's the same Artemis everywhere else. Here's the best analogy I can think of. Lady Liberty and Lightning the World in New York Harbor has an immigration flavor that the yeah. same statue in Paris doesn't have. Okay. Artemis in Ephesus has some qualities. It's the same Artemis, maybe like Mary of Guadalupe, right? It's still Jesus's mother, but there's some local stuff happening. Okay. And Artemis in Ephesus, both in antiquity, uh, because Ephesus is her birthplace, um, and in New Testament times, it is a goddess of midwifery. Okay. Yeah. She is committed to virginity. She has arrows that can euthanize. I suspect that a woman who is a new Christian, who is terrified that the biggest thing she's walked away from as a benefit in Artemis worship is protection in childbirth, which is the number one cause of death for women. Yeah. And so they're probably praying either kill me quickly and painlessly or deliver me safely. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of why Artemis became a goddess of midwifery is because her father is Zeus, who's the big daddy god. And Zeus is married uh, to Hera, who's very powerful. But Zeus has a little dalliance with Leto and Leto gets pregnant with twins. And the world is very unfriendly to Leto when she's ready to deliver because they don't want to hack off the wife, right? Yeah. But she finds an, a, a grove of trees near Ortigia, which has been placed near Ephesus. And Artemis is born first. Okay. Firstborn. Oh, born first. so. So Adam, it's their creation so, so story, the, the woman is first. That's the backdrop of the... 213 when Paul Indeed. goes out of his way to say it was Paul, it was Adam that was born first. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah. I, so if we just look at the line, Adam was born first, we're not going to say that's a principle. <laughs> like if you're just reading at face value, if you're in a hermeneutics class and you say Adam born first, you're going to say that's a narrative. Mm -hmm. And yeah. we principalize it and make it about firstness being preeminence. Right. But we could also read it that there's a big creation story that has affected women's attitudes. And Paul is create is answering a creation story with the creation story. Not only was Adam first, but he was even deceived. So get off your high horse, basically. Okay. So that, okay. So I've, I've read other works that try to situate some kind of proto-Gnostic creation myth there. Because you do have mm -hmm. kind of a, a different spin on the creation 
story, I see creation myth, creation story um, through Gnostic literature, but that, again, that's late, kind of like the, you know, um, yeah. so could there have been some kind of proto-Gnostic readings around the first century? That's I don't know about figure? proto-Gnostic. Well, let me address that in a second. Okay. I think Paul has the specific birth narrative in mind. Okay. Artemis is to Ephesus like Jesus is to Bethlehem. Oh, okay. Well. Yeah. That that is the place where the birth happened. It's celebrated annually with a big parade. Yeah. It's the natal city. It's a pilgrimage city. And we know both from the book of Acts, that's my primary document, yeah. um, but also from antiquity that there, you know, the temple is one of the seven wonders of the I mean, it's massive temple. It's renowned yeah. is known empire wide. And so we don't really even have to get too much into Gnosticism or proto-Gnosticism. Uh, and it, I mean, that's a whole nother question. I do think that you have what we might consider the perfect seedbed where Gnosticism could flourish later in a cult that is really into virginity. Okay. Really, I mean, don't marry, don't taste, don't touch. Like we have misread it. I think when we looked at it as her being a sex and fertility goddess, it is the exact opposite. It was asceticism. It was virginity. And so maybe while the Corinthians need to be told, hey, think about staying single, the Ephesians, uh, let's talk about getting married and having kids. <laughs> Interesting. You also, you do have a first century work. I'm blanking on it. I, I have my notes here. Um, is it Ditter, Ditter, Didormus? Or I, I read an article that. A, a, a first century work written it's a, it's a it's a it's a um it's an it's a um fictional piece so it's a story oh, yeah okay it's, it's written in well, the first Xenophon's century got a, xenophon has uh yeah him yeah okay and so he, here here's a story for you so xenophon is a, a a fiction writer in the period i'm looking at yes in and Ephesus, got these, right? <laughs> yes and and very possibly uh was an inspiration for romeo and juliet Oh, um, very possibly. And it's set in Ephesus and they make offerings to Artemis and they pray to Artemis. Uh, we, one of the things that we see in this is how geographical gods and goddesses are, uh, but Artemis, you know, they pray to her when they're outside of Ephesus, but really, you know, she's the queen of Ephesus. Um, and when I initially didn't so I did my dissertation on this, but when I did my dissertation, I didn't include that because they were dating it at right. as a third century work. Yes. And so what has been fun since it's been redated to the period I'm looking at, I had a guy walk into my office at Dallas Seminary one day and sit down and said, We have been doing parallel work without knowing about each other and have reached some of the same conclusions. It was Gary Hogue, and he did yes. he I read his article. Yeah. On on the influence of Artemis on the wealth stuff okay. in the pastorals you know the the gold and the pearls and teach uh you know uh yeah there's all kinds of mentions of wealth and money and materialism in first and second timothy and so he he was looking that at that through the grid of what was said in artemis work okay. and both of us have concluded that both in the wealth stuff and on the women slash wives stuff that paul is using all kinds of words that they would have recognized yeah. in the same and connected with Artemis in the same way that we would connect kryptonite with Superman. So your your work that you've done resonates with uh, Hogue's stuff that, and that parallel study he did. Yeah, so we were looking at different parts of the pastoral. Sure. But we both basically concluded all kinds of word overlap in okay. the Artemis inscriptions and mentality, uh, even fiery darts of the devil. You got to. A goddess who's shooting arrows. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Ephesians 6, he's writing to the Ephesians talking about spiritual warfare. And you got so some of these the, words that they might have thought. Of. I'm trying to, let me put, play the critic. Um, and I don't even know if I, I have not done enough study to even be a good devil's advocate. But like, so he he never mentions Artemis in the pastorals. Um, I, yeah, I'm gonna, Paul never mentions Luke, any god. <laughs> Luke okay. will. Luke will mention Hermes. Paul seems to go out of his way to never utter the name of a god. He's a good Jew, right? Oh, interesting. So, because I, I, I thought you were going to say, well, he doesn't need to because it's just kind of there. But you're saying he's probably deliberately avoiding. I think it's totally but deliberate. He, yeah. But his, so his wording is going to, the, the original audience is going to clearly make the connection. Is that what you're saying? Okay. 
Yeah. So Paul typically begins his epistles with grace and peace to you. Mm-hmm. Um, I are, One of the names of Artemis is Artemis Savior, Soteria. Okay. Paul begins First Timothy with a reference to God as Savior, like right out of the shoe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like, and Savior is not a word. I mean, if you do a word study on Savior, you're like, yeah, it's really not a big Pauline uh word it's it's not a word that gets used a lot for christ as savior in uh in pauline work yeah but when he's talking to the ephesians uh or, or timothy in ephesus he's yeah. he's pulling out also you find it in titus which has a big uh probably a big influence is, uh, from artemis as well I, i've got a question this is a little i mean it's on the topic actually but um a lot of the complementarian scholars I read. And I love, I love that you're just trying to do good historical work without a major axe or grind. Cause I, I didn't know where it would lead. Yeah. yeah. For my, when I read just like historical reconstructive kind of works that don't have kind of like a modern day agenda to land on this view, I personally tend to trust it a little more. And um, one of my favorites is I've mentioned him a lot on the podcast, but Bruce Winter, who I think has done a lot of just rich, rich historical work, but he, he doesn't, like explicitly kind of like trying to push kind of a modern interpretive conclusion. He's just trying to open up the, the background a little bit more. So I, 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 I love that that's kind of your angle. Have you interacted with uh, Steve Baugh's work? And I asked because he, a lot of complementarians will draw on his historical work on Ephesus. And I forget exactly what they draw on, but they often reference him to say a lot of these kind of background ways of reading first Timothy aren't legitimate. Steve Baugh has kind of painted a, a better background here where we can't kind of pinpoint what's going mm-hmm. on in Paul's letter to pin it on kind of some historical situation. Is this how I, is, love Steve re- was that? I love his work. Okay. And I think does it conflict example, with what you're does it conflict with what you're doing? Can you summarize his work and and maybe put it in okay. dialogue with what you're doing? Yeah. So first of all, Steve Baugh makes a really strong case that Artemis is not a mother goddess. Okay. Okay. And he's like, it's really hard to argue from silence. But if you're reading inscriptions all day and you're there all day and you never see any references to mother and you only see references of virginity and you never see anything about prostitution. Yeah, it's hard to prove the absence of something, but um, it's not there. And that was completely what I found. Uh, My findings completely matched his work on that. He also has done excellent work on what were the different titles that would have been given to women who are part of the priestess, you know, cult. He's done great work on that, like six different job descriptions that we'll find in the inscriptions of she was a priestess or she was one of the apparel. There was a there was a like a clergy role in the cult for somebody just to dress the goddess, it looks like, um, which fits with fancy apparel. Um, anyway, so I think that, um, where, where he and I differ is on the ramifications. Okay. Okay. So I think he, but a lot of people who've come up with ramifications have been people like the Kragers who I was quoting earlier, who've said she's a fertility goddess or she's a mother goddess. And I think where we missed the boat in criticizing them was we wrote off Artemis altogether, even though the book of Acts gives us a really good flag that that's what's happening in Ephesus. But because their dates were off, and he's right in saying, yeah, that's just that's just off. Um, and so we, we needed another look at what does it mean? Um, so yeah, so I, I, we agree that Artemis is not a mother goddess. And we've also agree that if you see a statue of Artemis of Ephesus, it's going to look like she's covered with breasts. You're right. And yeah. Jerome refers to her in the fourth century as multi or polymaston, multi-breasted. And we both completely agree that that is not what those are. Okay. And also, in the West, we tend to think if something is breasty, then it's sexy, <laughs> which <laughs> is not necessarily yeah. how uh, something coming out of a Hittite world or Anatolian world is going to make that connection, right? They don't have formula. They don't, yeah, they don't have nursing rooms. It's it's just, you know, part yeah. of being a mother. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also, yeah, he didn't see her as a mother goddess. And that my the title of my forthcoming book is Nobody's Mother. And not everybody agrees with me on that. But again, I'm like, she's a virgin, <laughs> a confirmed virgin. And a hundred percent of the sources that I found in Ephesus 
relating to Ephesus uh, stick to that narrative. You might find a different narrative far away in the empire for Artemis, but I'm just interested in sort of roughly 200 BC to 280. I really prefer 100, uh, 100 to 100. Of what did those people say? And my tools of analysis are what are the literary sources in that time? What are the epigraphic or the inscription sources in that time? What are the coins from that time tell us? What does okay. the architecture from that time tell us? So whereas in the past we were looking at a synoptic Artemis, both Bob and I would, would probably agree that we're just looking, our main interest is on for the New Testament interpretation, okay. which is going to really limit the years that we're looking at. I, I want to ask you an honest question. Are you and Ba? kind of the two let's just say evangelical authorities on the background of Ephesus and I I, I mean you did your no, just I would not put myself in that category but I would put Clinton Arnold up there oh, uh, yeah. I would put Richard Oster up there uh, Oster is is brilliant with inscriptions I owe a lot to his work and both Bob and Oster uh were the ones that initially pointed me through their works toward Artemis is not a fertility mothering goddess, which is what I suspected might be happening with saved through childbearing. Um, and so agreeing that the earlier work was looking at the wrong centuries, I'm relooking, recognizing that that was a legit poo-pooing, but we went too far in just writing off Artemis as any kind of influence in Ephesus. And fortunately, all the, I mean, there was a lot of conflict over this in the late 90s. Unfortunately, it's died down enough that we can revisit this without everybody having a real knee jerk reaction to. We already had, we already handled this. We already dealt with this. Yeah. Well, we did. I mean, so, we as I understand it, trying to get my arms, or my mind around the scholarly kind of trajectory here, is it, uh, you pronounced it uh, Krager and Krager? I'm familiar yes. with, I've not read their book, but they, they're the ones who made a lot about. Artemis is a background for Ephesians 2. They're drawn on later sources. They got, because I see loads of egalitarians critique. I, I haven't seen anybody speak positively of their work in, their, in the sources, at least. They're kind of like, yeah, that thesis has been denounced. Pro probably Bob played a role in denouncing that. So you're saying, yes, they had the wrong conclusion about who Artemis was. They're drawn on later sources, but there's a lot of rich first century material we can revisit to kind of reconstruct a proper background rather than dismissing perfect the background. Perfect summary. Oh, good. Okay. Um, here's That's part perfect. of why they're so influential. So, you know, Craiger and Craiger, married couple, founded, I think she was the founder of Christians for Biblical Equality, oh. which is the egalitarian yeah. group. <laughs> and so, you know, she's their founder. And I remember going to the Evangelical Theological Society and seeing a bookmark that was being handed out at their booth of this, you know, picture of this Artemis of Ephesus that looks like she's got a lot of breasts. Yeah. Um, we should probably talk about what those really are. But anyway, yeah, I, 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 I have that question. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, again, and it's talking about her being a fertility goddess. I'm like, yeah, no, I, I'm not hearing anybody else. I'm not hearing the historians say this to their credit. CBE uh, invited me to their national meeting to present my research, and I got permission from the school where I teach um, to go teach there uh, and, and to present my work. And actually, it was there that the book contract came into motion with oh, wow. somebody that was sitting there from IVP. Okay. And, it, you know, it was uh, it was well received. Those who had come were like, we just want to know what the Bible says. <laughs> you know, we just want to know the truth. And so let's explore this together. Some were like, I'm glad that we can have a high view of Paul and still factor in backgrounds. I'm glad we can have a high view of scripture and factor in backgrounds. And we need help on knowing when do you do that? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, uh, so helpful. Um, yeah. So what are, what are those breast like looking things? So I was in Ephesus, gosh, this is 20, four years ago. And I still remember going to the museum, seeing the statue and everybody's saying you know, these are breasts or whatever and fertility goddess. So um, yeah. yeah, I'm familiar with well, that. Here are some hints for what, for why we eliminate breasts before I'm going to talk about what we think they are. So one thing is they're completely lacking nipples. It's pretty yeah. hard to be nursing if you don't have nipples. So same shape, except not. The other thing is you've got like a statue of Zeus with the same thing. You've got some men showing up with oh. that. And okay. probably pectoral armor. Okay. Um, so that's another big thing. Um, another is that on some of them, they are really down at her stomach, not high yeah. enough to be breast. Um, so then you start on the journey. One of my colleagues 
uh, at DTS, um, was the first to introduce me to the work of a guy who was had been with the Australia. The Australians have really dominated the archaeological uh, work there for more than a hundred years, and a guy who had been there since like his twenties, and it ended up leading the whole thing. And he had discovered a bunch of ha- amber pendants with holes at the top, so you could string them together that were the exact same shape. And um, so he uh, sort of brought forth this idea that that shape really matched um, a super early depiction of the goddess that very well may be the reference in Acts when it talks about the image that fell from heaven. The actual word is diopet or Zeus fallen. Um, And uh, as it turned out, the Liverpool Museum had something that was described as a diopet that had been taken from Ephesus uh, that they sent me pictures of. My editor made me, you know, it didn't make me, but they, I had to cut that whole section out because it was a big major bunny trail. But I think we might have solved what the image was that they think fell from heaven. But anyway, he, um, this archaeologist is seeing the same shape picked up from the original okay. god in the city. But then more recently, uh, maybe in the last 10 years, he was a co-sponsor of a conference in Ephesus that brought in a historian to look at that. And I think she has the best explanation. And that is, we've been looking at these as breasty, sort of european interpretations. And we should have been looking at more Hittite-y. Uh, in this part of the world, the Hittite influence was much greater. Like there are some bees on the side of Artemis's leg on the statue. And we've read that as like mother bee. And they're like, yeah, no, they didn't know bees were women until like the 18th century. And they discovered, you know, King Bee had ovaries. Uh, Probably not so much a queen bee as a Hittite story about a bee. And probably that, probably those breasty looking things are magic sacks. Magic sacks. Okay. Okay. Magic so it's sex. connected to kind of the, it's connected to Zeus, you're saying. Um, I'm saying it's connected to magic, oh, magic. and okay. connected with more Hittite mythology than, see, we look at Diana, you know, as the influence of conflation of Artemis and kind of go that direction. She, they're like, yeah, maybe more of a, a Hittite conflation than a Diana. Because Ephesus is in ancient, where the ancient Hittite kingdom was, right? It was in Asia Minor. <laughs> Anatolia, yes. Anatolia, yeah. Okay. It's a okay. tight world, yes. Right. And, you know, Smithsonian has come out, Smithsonian and National Geographic have both said, hey, you know what? We've found the Amazons are probably real. And um, Can you explain yeah. Amazon? We're all just thinking of like the online store. What uh, What is an Amazon? Amazon women, uh, yeah. one breast, uh, yeah. they're carrying bows and arrows. All kinds of works from antiquity connect Artemis and Ephesus with the Amazon myth. They say Amazon women camped around her uh, temple that they uh, worshipped uh, as as part of the natal story on a regular basis. We see an Amazon women connection in that uh, novel you were talking about. And so, again, you think Amazon women. Yeah, these are without man women. Oh, didn't warrior, hate warrior women, one breast. Didn't, yes, they didn't hate men, but they they were not men and women like in partnership. There was no parody there. P-A-R-I-T, okay. not P-A-R-O-D-Y. No parody. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Biola University. Biola is consistently ranked as one of the nation's leading Christian universities. It has over 300 academic programs at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, which are available both in Southern California and online. With leading academic programs like business, film, science, and more, uh, Biola's biblically integrated curriculum and spiritual formation also helps students grow closer to God and gain a deeper understanding of scripture. In fact, I was just on the campus of Biola touring, touring the campus and talking to several deans and professors, and every single person I talked to was so utterly passionate about making Christ first in all things and instilling Christ-like virtues in the hearts and minds of their students. I mean, honestly, I was so impressed with how Christ-centered the entire school is. So at Biola, students become equipped for living a thriving life and career. They'll also learn how to articulate their Christian beliefs. And most of all, they'll be prepared to serve as God's instrument in their communities and around the world. Now, through May 1st, 2023, if you use the promo code PRESTON, okay, my name, Preston, 
uh, that will waive the application fee for any Biolet program, okay? So promo code Preston, waive the fee. Some restrictions might apply. Just visit biolet.edu for more information. Hello friends, registration is now open for Exiles and Babylon Conference and I cannot wait for this conference. Here's a few topics that we're gonna wrestle with. The future of the church, disability in the church, multi-ethnic perspectives on American Christianity and a conversational debate on the problem of evil and suffering. We have Eugene Cho, Elise Fitzpatrick, Matt Chandler, Michelle Sanchez, Justin Gibney, Devin Stahl, Lamar Hardwick, the list goes on and on. Joey Dodson's gonna be there. Um, Greg Boyd and Clay Jones, are, they're gonna be engaging in this conversational debate on the problem of evil and suffering and of course we have to have ellie bonilla and street hymns back by popular demand and tanika wyatt and evan wickham will be leading our multi-ethnic worship again we're also adding a pre-conference this year so we're going to do a, um, an in-depth scholarly conversation on the question of women in ministry featuring two scholars on each side of the issue so uh, doctors gary Bashirs and sydney park are on the complementarian side and doctors cynthia long westfall and philip payne on the egal Egalitarian side. So March 23rd to 25th, 2023 here in Boise, Idaho. We sold out last year and we'll probably sell out this year again. Uh, so if you want to come, if you want to come live, then I would register sooner than later. And you can always attend virtually if you can't make it out to Boise in person. So all the info is at theologyintheraw.com. That's theologyintheraw.com. Would you say that the uh, the view of women in Ephesus was somewhat unique given all of these cultural influences. And if so, what would take us back to first century Ephesus? What, what would be the kind of women of the view of women that would be in the air? What would women be wrestling with there? These kind of pre-converted, they're not Christians yet. What are they, what kind of view of women are they, are they growing up with? Well, the first, the number one thing on their minds is terror of childbirth. Okay. And you have just taken away their comfort. Um, and I think that you see Paul in some places, not just, you know, in, in this section, but you see him um, taking on almost the imagery of himself as mother, right? Um, um, uh, caring for them and nurturing them and uh, the, the church as a family. And so I think what, what we don't see, and this is why I appreciate Ba's work as well, is what we don't see is feminism. And that's totally reading back in a United States sort of phenomenon. And what you don't have in Artemis is she's not a man hater. There are lots of men who follow her. In fact, we have one mentioned in the New Testament whose parents named him Artemis. <laughs> and Paul <laughs> refers to him, right? There, there were over a hundred names that were derivatives of Artemis in the inscriptions. And so that's part of the challenge too, is sorting out people named after Artemis with the, act, the actual references to the goddess because there's so much uh, reference. So men and women, uh, so men and women are worshiping her and bringing offerings to her. There's one inscription that talks about a man who brings his in, inheritance to the goddess. I think Paul picks up on that kind of thing and said, no, 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 you in Christ, inherit. In fact, your inheritance is God. <laughs> like they bring their inheritance to her, you get an inheritance, and it's God Himself. So, but back to what the average woman would have been thinking: she's terrified of childbirth, and uh, she's also in a city where virginity is a core value. I think that is how we account for so many single women in the church. That Paul has to divide widows into three categories. So, so a lot more single women under the influence of Artemis. Um, there would have been a lot more single women at Ephesus than maybe the average city. S single women being like of marital age. Um, it, it would appear. I mean, that's a lot of widows. There are so many widows. He's got some. I want some are young enough. I want you to get married and have kids. Uh -huh. You know, if you're over sixty, let's you know make you part of the clergy, uh, and. Uh, here, so here are the qualifications that are roughly parallel to that of the elders. You got you have to have been the wife of one husband. You have to have washed the feet of the saints. Like that is not qualifications for getting food, right? <laughs> huh. That is not a Christian view of who we feed. We feed the hungry, right? Yeah. So you're um, saying, okay, so man, uh, let's chase this a little bit. So talk talk to us about 
what is going on in First Timothy five and the widows? You're you're saying you reference clergy. You're saying this isn't just caring for women whose husbands have died. You, you're right. Well, you you take take it from there. Well, what's going on? Well, I'll tell you how that one started. I was reading Kittle, which is my you know the dictionary theological dictionary that if you Today, all my students have it, of course, in MP3 or on Logos or whatever. But I had it, and it took an entire bookshelf. Um, and the section on widows, I'm reading along because I'm studying widows in the New, you know, New Testament or something. And the last entry mentions it as the church office. I'm like, what? Huh. And it's talking about all this evidence that widow was an office. So I traced the office of widow. And uh, and I and in fact I presented on it at Evangelical Theological Society. On um, my hypothesis is that the church is not a single parent family with only fathers. That the church is a family, and it has fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers. And a lot of this is based on the historical evidence. So, for example, one of the things that we're finding. Um, and, and the reason we're finding some of this is because we have more women doing PhDs in history than we had 100 years ago, right? And so even though men have cared about these issues, they haven't been as driven because it wasn't necessarily about them. So, and I don't mean that in any sort of mean way. I just mean I studied what I was passionate about because it, it had ramifications for my life. And so one thing we're finding, for example, is tombstones that reference a widow of the church of, and we've thought that just, you know, she's the wife of Sylvanus. And then we find out, no, if she's the wife of Sylvanus, Sylvanus is on the tombstone. As she's the widow of Sylvanus. But over here, when you got a whole group of widows buried around a church and they're widows of the church of, oh, that's a different thing from a widow of Sylvanus. So it looks like, and, and there's still so much, uh, so many dissertations to be done. If some of your listeners want to do historical work, this is where I would love to see more work done. And that is um, the evidence suggests that in the early, early church, that the reason we're not finding much evidence for deaconesses till about the third century is because they're called widows early on. And we've missed evidence of widows because we've just thought of them as women who lost husbands and haven't connected them with an office. So what's the relationship on an authority level, if that's even the right word to use? Maybe it's not. What's the relationship between well, the, the widows and the elders? Are are the elders of chapter three, are they presumed to be all men and the women are kind of co-lead and the widows are co eldering with the male elders or what's the relationship here Just yeah that's a good question i think the word elder probably functions similarly to how the word amigos works that elder in its plural um could include uh the fathers and mothers of the church but the woman's title a woman is not an elder she is a widow and some of this is hard for us to process in our western minds because uh, then the first question becomes, does that mean a married woman can't serve? Yeah. Well, a married woman, I mean, again, I'm a married woman and my child is grown, but I would be dead in Ephesus because I'm over 60. Like there would be very few of me, right? I mean, the average life expectancy is less than 45. And, uh, you know, half your kids are dying and you're dying. Half of you are dying in childbirth. I don't know what the numbers are, but they're high. Uh, lots of you are dying in childbirth. So um, you ask what the authority structure is. I think it's very similar to fathers and mothers. And I think they might even look at elders today and go, uh, you're counseling women? <laughs> like, like you're baptizing women? Now, some of this changed when we started in doing infant baptism because you had women baptizing women. And a lot of, you know, a lot of them are being baptized nude. You're just not going to have the... A senior pastor is not going to be a thing, and he's not going to be baptizing women. So you probably had, particularly in the, in the East, you had more segregation. I am not calling for segregation. I'm just describing what probably was. But I suspect that some of them would look at what we're doing now and go, well, you're worried about women overstepping their bounds, but I think men have overstepped their bounds here. We need fathers and mothers. We need to be partnering. And one of the pieces of the visual record is you see a lot more men and women partnering than you see just one gender. It's it's brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers. 
So you opened up another door there. Let's wander into I know. it. I, did. Oh, I love it. I love, I love uh, kind of circular uh, wandering conversations. I love it. Visual. What do you mean by the visual representation? Um, so uh, let's see, like in Venice, there is a very, there's a small, I don't know, it's as big as a Kleenex box, maybe smaller reliquary, a, a place where you would store relics. And on one side, you have a man and woman at the altar of probably the old St. Peter's holding up the communion elements. If you go to Ravenna and you look at the mosaics, you will see on one side the emperor who has been sainted and his wife Theodora who you know has been sainted because they were pro-Christian and pro-Orthodox. Um, and on one side, he's carrying the, I think he's carrying the, the wine and she's carrying the bread. I might have it backwards, but there, there, there's this parity in the space above the altar where man and woman are partnering together. And, and then you start thinking about Genesis of us doing church together, us as a family. You look at Paul's metaphors of male and female partnering. And I think that authority is a big Western issue, but yeah. not so much, right? And even when Paul talks about authority, he's going out of his way to use words. It frustrates us. He uses words like elder, which is old guy deacon which is servant like he is taking the bubble of authority and popping it and saying yeah if it exists we don't do it like the gentiles do like the greatest among you is the one who is washing poop off the disciples feet (laughs) right Right. um so i mean you you see that with the household codes right you're like they exist they take the structure then they just pop them up all their authority words and say lay down your life give up selfless yeah, it's it's pretty fascinating that one of the main Greek words for authority, exousia, exousia, Paul rarely, if ever, uses that to describe church leaders. He uses it to describe demonic powers. He uses it to describe the Roman Empire, which is incredibly oppressive um, in Romans 13 um, and uh, other factors. Um, but I don't know if he, I don't, there might be one passage I found where he connects that to kind of maybe. Um but yeah, it's it's church leaders are servants. Um, they I don't even think he would like servant leadership. He he, yeah. he doesn't say Paul is a servant leader of the church of blah 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 blah. Yeah, right? like he does talk about being apostle when he has to because they because they're not getting it. But he doesn't like it. Like he's like you can tell. Like I hate to have to do this. You yeah. made me have to do this, but I'd really rather down, be servant. He downplays his apost- apostolic authority. I, I would think more than he elevates yeah. it. even even the one of the fascinating passage or texts is philemon where you know he's trying to get philemon to do something it's the one yeah. i think it's one yeah. of the only letters where he never even mentioned his apostolic he could have yeah. said look i'm an apostle you're not onesimus is coming back deal with it or i'm going to come with a rod you know um but he actually never kind of appeals he appeals to like hey i know you're going to do the right thing you know like he really wants him to be familial language yeah Family. yeah that's what I find so fascinating in this in this debate is I think I just wonder if we get off on the wrong foot right out of the gate when we assume certain hierarchical structures of leadership that are prevalent in many churches today. And then we kind of ask Paul, OK, well, who can serve in what part of this hierarchy? And I, I just I don't know. I wonder if bringing that hierarchical structure is is kind of wrong headed right out of the gate. We talked offline about that a little bit. I mean, I think ecclesiology is very much. Rethinking our ecclesiology is just as important as rethinking the question of women in that those ecclesiological structures. Which takes us to Romans 16. Um, you know, we so often, at least in, in the world of women in the Bible, are talking about the Proverbs 31 woman. I heard an excellent presentation by one of Lynn Kohick's students in Italy a couple uh, weeks ago where she talked about the Romans 16 woman. And begins with Phoebe the deacon and the benefactor, and then these co-workers and you know Trifosa and and Rufus's mother is a mother to me, uh, mm-hmm. and so different kinds of co-workers. Um, yeah. And uh, another presentation I heard at, at ETS, the Evangelical Theological Society, was looking at uh, is is it possible that Phoebe as a benefactor uh, had a legal element involved? Uh, and legal representation uh, it, it's there's so much work being done um and a lot of it's a great time to be doing historical work because we have the internet now 
So yeah. I can not only read an Anatolian journal, which my colleague sent me to that I'd never heard of, and it probably only had a circulation at the time of 300, but now yeah. I can find it and run it through Google Translate so I can read it. Yeah. Uh, none of that was available to me. Uh, and then we're living longer. And so I, I've raised my daughter and now I, you know, I've spent the last 15, 20 years in the academy. And if I live as, old, as long as some of my colleagues, I'll have another 15 or 20. I mean, I die tomorrow, but or today. But, you know, some of us are living well into our 70s and 80s, continuing to, to mentor students. And yeah. it gives us the opportunity to build on a lot more uh, research. I just, I just did. Um, yeah, speaking of yeah, just the Internet and this technology now. So I was in uh, Cambridge doing research on First Timothy 2. And uh, I was doing, I was looking at the Greek word authenteo, you know, translated yep. exercise authority in First Timothy two twelve. Super debated word. What does it mean? It's it's not used very widely in Greek literature, but it's used a lot in second century papyri. I'm like, I don't even go find. How do I? And then one of the scholars at Tyndale, Alice Peter Head, is like, Oh, I got the PDF. Here, let me send it to you. And he's like, Send me. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like, just go to this website, you it. Put it in, it'll pop up. You have the original language, this that. And so I'm sitting there like on a computer, like looking at second century papyri you know like we well, could have done that i mean Did not five, done that. Years ago, you know it's so, a great but, time oh man it's exciting okay let's go back to first timothy 2 and that debated passage 212 i do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man she must be in different translations uh be in quietness i think would be the most literal clunky way of saying uh, translating that um what are your so given your background, how are you how are you now reading, I guess, that verse, but also maybe that passage as a whole? What is Paul, if you take us back to the first century, what are Paul hearing? What what are Paul's audience hearing when he writes that letter? Um, I think first of all, we have to ask the question of let's ask it backwards. If Paul believes that there is a priority in maleness that means women in every context of the gathered church should be silent for all time in every place, then um, how do we deal with, In I'm a dispensationalist, so how do we deal with the fact that in every dispensation, there's a male prophet, we find at least one female prophet? Um, that doesn't square if we're going to ground that in creation like if we're going to ground that in genesis then that would be for all time it wouldn't matter right and then you have some settings like a holda in second kings 22 where there are good prophets to be found but they're still going to get this is the word of let's say it the lord from a female prophetess and so you you look at that as your backdrop and then you have Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, not asking, the, the question isn't, can a woman prophesy? It's what, she, what she's supposed to do with her hair yeah. or her head. When she's but he assumes the women in the gathered church are going to be praying and prophesying. And so what do you do with Paul? <laughs> because mm-hmm. he's a smart man. He's a very good, he's very good at rhetoric. Why three chapters later in 14, you know, how do we square? So just with a global view of scripture and and where we're going in Revelation to where we are all a kingdom of priests. We are not, it doesn't talk about male priesthood, of, you know, even the Reformation, you have the priesthood of all believers. Right. Like I am a priest of God. You're what does a priest do? Well, hopefully I help bring you to God. I help you offer offerings. I help you offer praise. Um, so I think we have to, to have a biblical view. <laughs> like a more global view to begin with, but also we don't just look at Genesis. We also look at Revelation, where where are we headed, Mm -hmm. right? And we don't root our view of women in Genesis 3 in the fall. We root it in what was she made to do? She's made to have co-dominion with her brothers. And she's made to be fruitful and multiply, which in the in New Testament times I take to be multiplying disciples. Actually, I think that was some of that all the way through. But clearly, if you got a world with no people in it, you, you know, you got work to do. Um, <laughs> but to see both of those as a partnership. And I think this comes up in First Timothy, that I think they that Paul is beginning with an understanding of male-female partnership in ministry that he has lived 
And we see it in Romans 11. Like he doesn't address that to the deacons and elders and the the, the bros, right? It's it's men and women alike that are partnering. With, I mean, Junia was in jail with him. Mm-hmm. Um, so when you come to 1 Timothy 2, he is bringing up Genesis mm-hmm. uh, as I think he's bringing it up as a corrective to whatever is happening. And I don't think we have to solve or even can solve what is happening. I think we can only read it back from one part of the telephone conversation. Yeah, And something's happening where three times Paul needs to use the word quiet when he's talking about women. Mm-hmm. And we don't think that Paul thinks women are supposed to be quiet everywhere because again, he, 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 there are prophetesses, you know, Philip's daughters are prophetesses. He is not in any way suggesting women should be quiet in Romans 16. These are coworkers in what the gospel, like you've got to use words as in addition to actions for the gospel. Um, So I I think when he comes to first Timothy two, we have to, look at a couple things. First of all, he is writing a personal letter to Timothy. That is not to say it has no ramifications for us, but it would seem very strange that if this is the one place where he, Paul lays out the foundation for what a woman is and what she's supposed to be in the church, it's in a private letter in a certain city with a troubled context, and he's using first person language. So it would be troubling to just say, Paul says, I'm not allowing, and look at that present tense to go, yeah, that's reading a lot into the present tense Mm -hmm. to just say, I'm not allowing. But the combination of I with the present tense, I'm not allowing this, doesn't sound like women shouldn't ever, or it's foundational, you know, this is the way God made things for all time. If he's putting it in first person present tense language, why is this his practice? We see him using first person present tense language over in Corinth when he's talking about whether they should get married or not. And, and, you know, I'm in the wisdom I have, but this isn't what the Lord said. Mm -hmm. Certainly it's scripture, but that's not the same thing as quoting Jesus. I mean, he's making a distinction. Am I making sense? You you (laughs) are. I I literally just did a podcast yesterday with Bill Mounts on this. (laughs) And, um, and then I was interacting with uh, Phil, Phil Payne. Yep. Um, He's done a lot of work. Yeah, he's done a ton of ton of work on this topic. The guy's a machine. Um, he'll he'll send. And, me and I love about the pain that he has a zillion footnotes, like better than oh any God. scholar I know. Yeah. I can follow sources with Bill Payne yeah. so that even if I disagree with them, I can go back to the original sources and dig from there in a way that, I mean, yeah. it, it means he writes this much stuff and has this many footnotes. Oh my but, gosh. And he literally will email, he'll email scholars, like 10 page emails saying, here's where, you know, I, I, I think you're off and here's why. And then the, he responds and the guy's like made it his life mission to dig into this topic. But I know he makes a lot out of the present tense. I am not permitting other egalitarians. I mean, I, Howard Marshall, Phil Towner say, yeah, I think we're pushing it too far. If we make it bill mounts. Um, yeah. He said he, he got into kind of aspect theory and the, the nature of the present tense and, and thought there wasn't much there. So I, I, yeah, all that to say, I don't I'm, think we, I don't think we should make too much of the present tense. It's the combination okay. of the per- first person with okay. the present tense that makes me go, oh, um, if yeah. I say I'm not doing something, that sounds very different from one should never. Okay. Or this so, is, yeah. so the teach and exercise authority over, without even looking at what exercise and authority or assuming authority means, mm-hmm. um, would you say that there's at least a the possibility of a legitimate reading where Paul is addressing a local scenario and not making a universal prohibition. Is that kind of what you're exploring? Or... I think that's exactly what's happening. I think the whole book is addressing a local scenario with ramifications for us. How do we handle false teachers? Okay. You know, what do we do when men and women are fighting? Uh, you know, all, there are all kinds of applications for us. What I often hear is, oh, well, the minute you say there's a local situation affecting that, you've got a low view of scripture, you've yeah. written off, like, and we've we've made it so that you can't have a local situation, right? And, you know, and it's like, yeah, there are lots of scriptures with a with probably a local situation, um, or even people say, well, you know, if you just read it at face value, I'm like, I wouldn't say that about baptizing the dead, <laughs> like if I just take yeah. those verses at face value. You know, without looking at backgrounds, I could have a very different doctrine. 
Um, I think there's it's the whole book and the whole argument and the fact that there are false teachers and the kinds of false teachers and the fact that his mitigating influence for I got bad news for some of the women. They need to be quiet and learn Mm -hmm. right now. Um, Nevertheless, here's an encouragement. Uh, Our God is bigger than their God and he has better benefits. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And I, I think. Let me let me add one more thing. When he says a woman will be saved through childbearing, I think he's quoting a local saying. Hmm. And that when he says this is a faithful saying, it should go with what he's just said. That's a saying rather than what follows, which is if somebody aspires to be an elder, they aspire to. Whoa, whoa, whoa. whoa. OK, I am. So in chapter three, verse one, which obviously there's no chapters in the original. Yep. Here is a yep. trustworthy saying. You're saying yep. that that's pointing back to what he just said yes, not that's what I forward. Think. Have, who has anybody else argued that you know if you look if you have a net bible diglot yeah. uh it it actually puts this is a faithful saying up up with chapter two and begins chapter three in the greek and then there's a little footnote uh that says uh if this may be a local maybe a local yeah interesting okay didn't you, originate you, with me you DTS people um, love your net Bible. <laughs> we do. Um, so it's in the Diglot Greek Greek notes, the way they've laid out the Greek. Okay. Um, and I, you know, so then I did a, a study on what are all the, this is the, this is a faithful saying that Paul did to see, does he usually put that line after or before the saying? Yeah. And it was no help because it's about half and half. Oh. Uh, but it, it, he does go both ways. Like sometimes he starts, this is a faithful saying, colon, and then, or he ends it, he'll make a statement and then say this is a faithful saying. Does Paul have a habit of putting a Christian spin on a fa- on a local saying? Yeah. Well, he yeah. does. And so I look to see, do all the faithful sayings have something in common? Most of them have the word save or salvation or the idea of salvation in them. Interesting. I think wow. there's like only one that doesn't. Is this in your book, your forthcoming book, or is this in your mm-hmm. dissertation? Okay, so we can't get a hold of it yet. I'm really excited to see that. Um, so, so what the women in Ephesus? Why did they need this prohibition in two twelve? You're saying because um, you're saying that well, there wasn't like some first first century feminist movement going on, like people used to argue. Yeah. But yeah. what was, I mean, it was, a, um, uh, yeah, what, what kind of, why Ephesus? What, 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 if you can reconstruct a possible historical background, like what, what yeah. kind of women is he speaking this it, to and why? Well, there are a number of possibilities. One is that there is a husband wife dynamic here and the husbands are angry and the wives need to be quiet and learn. Okay. You certainly could translate Gune as wife and one one argument for that uh the winstons do really good work on there's a husband wife couple uh george and dora winston who look at first peter and the section that we know for sure is about wives you know uh the submission and there's been the reference of sarah and you have almost the same outline here Mm-hmm. as you have in a passage of scripture that we know is talking about wives. Yeah. And they hypothesize that this is an apostolic addressing of wives. That you have uh, modesty, that you have a reference to a Old Testament husband and wife, that you, uh, yeah. So there, there are a lot of parallels in the two. So, so that raises a question, is the issue that Paul's addressing in 1 Timothy 2, about women in general or is there something happening with the wives Mm -hmm. and the fact that the ending relates to childbirth uh would tip it toward wives and then the fact that later on you have so many single women that are widows Mm -hmm. um, but he's not using widows there um so i mean there's still a lot of questions about it here's the question that my research answered for me pretty definitively is First Timothy full of hints about the Artemis cult? Mm-hmm. Does it draw constantly on the language and ideas all over the place? Okay. I I no longer, I once did, but I no longer think that when he says Adam was first, 
mm-hmm. that he is giving a principle of male firstness or preeminence. I think the it's a better hermeneutic to see Paul is using a creation story to correct a false creation story. And what follows in the Adam and Eve story from the fall? It's the woman has a problem with childbirth, right? Her pain is connected. So it's it's almost like he's taken that Genesis story as his narrative. Um, but he is, you know, in the Bethlehem of the Ephesians, taking their natal story and saying, God is bigger than Artemis. And you're, I think he's saying that they're not going to die if they have trusted in Christ. Now, that's the best use of sojo, like the, the yeah. word for save. Save through childbearing is literal. Um, I think that if you take it as a woman will be saved through Jesus, if, 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 like that raises some issues. Yeah. Right. So you're saying so though is is physical safety, not salvation in the kind of spiritual sense. Yeah. Which I, I think is probably the best. Bruce Winter made a really good case for that. I think every interpretation has pros and cons. The, the con to that is wait a minute, but women still do die in childbirth. Is this a false promise? Yeah. But yeah. that might be a modern. And then when you go, okay, how big is the church in Ephesus? Maybe 40 people? How many of them are of childbearing age? Like, I think it's very similar to James when it talks about bringing the elders and the person will be healed. And we're like, yeah, but people die. It's like, yeah, I mean, we also work in very remote Africa. And we see that when we take the gospel in, certain miracles happen. Uh, And sometimes the miracles are very related to the local God. Yeah. So I just don't think you're going to see Christian women who are trusting in Jesus dying in Artemis country. In the first century, as kind of a unique, possibly mir- quasi miraculous mm-hmm. response to people trusting in Artemis rather than trusting yeah. in God for yeah. certain things. Okay, no, oh, that's that's. I, I think that's the. I mean, it's it's a difficult verse for modern. Um, I that that of the options that I've wrestled with, that one has always made the best sense to me so far. Um, so I'm glad to hear you take that view. <laughs> it, <laughs> um, it seems to fit. A biblical theology in which a day is coming when men and women will serve together and we are a kingdom of priests. Um, and that's what we're supposed to be moving toward, right? Um, that I mean, we don't just wait for that to, to work toward that vision. It makes the most sense of why you would have women prophets and have them even in the church in 1 Corinthians 11. It makes the most sense for me of why in Romans 16, you have women who are full-on ministry partners and not being told to go home and take care of kids. Right, right. Uh, kids aren't even mentioned, not even mentioned in that passage. Children aren't mentioned in relation to Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, is, if this is Paul's value for women, that they should be in the nursery, uh, there, there's just some places that that's missing, um, if that's his thinking. Oh my word! When um, Sandra, thank you so much for your time. I we do have to wrap things up, but what what's the title of your book? When's it coming out? Um, it's still not nobody's be- mother. <laughs> nobody's mother. Okay. Nobody's and, uh, mother. Artemis of the Ephesians in the New Testament and antiquity. And my really- main goal is not arguing about First Timothy. It's arguing against those who think Artemis is a fertility goddess or that there's ritual prostitution happening. I'm more interested in the background of this. And when, when's the release date? Do you have a, a release, release date, date? Is ETS November of this year? Oh, this year. Okay. They oh. want to launch it at the Theological Society meeting. I will be there. Um, Thanks for the work you're doing, yeah. Dr. Sprinkle. You've yeah. <laughs> done hard work in this passage. And I, I really have appreciated that um, you're just trying to make the best of the text, of the backgrounds, be faithful to scripture, honor Paul, who I who I think has gotten a bad rap for women. <laughs> and yeah. I'm I'm here to say I think Paul was a friend of women. Oh man, yeah. No, I, I, I do agree. I can see where people get the bad rap stuff, but in his first century context, yes. he said some pretty radical things about humanizing women. Not as much as we would want him to, maybe, but um, yeah. No, that's that's without what he does with the household codes. I mean, goodness, read that against the backdrop yeah. of Aristotle. It's like he would have been a yeah. second wave feminist, you know. He just, he just sucked the wind out of the authority, the Gentile authority picture yeah. in that. 
yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I cannot wait to get my hands on your uh, book. In fact, I'm going to reach out to your publisher, maybe get a pre-release copy, <laughs> as I often do. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for your time and uh, appreciate the work you're doing. All right. Thanks a lot. This show is part of the Converge Podcast Network.